welcome back. Today we're going to read through, well, I'm not sure. So I found this article while searching for something else. Searching for something, just machine learning, or I'm sorry, I was trying to find a chess engine that implemented a proximal policy optimization. Um, and somehow I typed in the magic keywords that brought up this 2010 article by an independent scholar. So, um, to me at least, at first glance, this seemed legit. So we're going to try to dive in with, uh, this together and take a look at it and see what we can figure out. Um, and for those of you following at home, uh, you can type exclamation point heuristic. I've just added a command to uh, phantom bot here. So it'll spit out the link. Um, and for those watching the VOD, I'll hopefully remember to link to the article. If not, the author's name is plainly visible here, and an internet search can quickly uh, find this. So uh, without further ado, let's get it in. The proposed heuristic for a computer chess program. Copyright 2010 by John L. Jairs. Fairfax, Virginia. Independent scholar. All right. So how might we create an evaluation function for a computer chess program that plays a stronger positional game of chess? A new heuristic for estimating the positional pressure produced by chess pieces is proposed. We construct an evaluation from a systems perspective using a dynamic model of the interaction of the pieces, the identification and management of stressors, and the construction of resilient positions allow effective cutoffs for less promising game continuations due to the perceived presence of adaptive capacity. We calculate and maintain a database of potential mobility for each chess piece three moves into the future. For each position, we evaluate in the search tree. We determine the likely restrictions placed on the future mobility of the pieces um, based on the attack paths of lower valued enemy pieces. Initial results are presented. Uh, keywords, complexity, chess, game theory, constraints, heuristics, planning, management, diagnostic test, and resilience. And for what it's worth, um, back in, well, what year was that? I think it was 06 or 07. I developed a chess engine that applied a very similar principle. And so, while I might not have taken the same academic rigor to it, I had quite a bit of fun trying to apply a very similar concept. Um, just maximizing the piece mobility, even to the point where that would um, take a higher, uh, what's the word, priority? A higher level of importance versus uh, the material count. So it's a way you can um, uh, analyze a chess game, trying to attack a king and prevent it from castling and becoming more mobile and escaping your attacks and limiting the mobility of your opponent's pieces. Um, but I'm sure his implementation is probably more sound than mine was because I was just doing it as a fun project and didn't have anybody reviewing it. Um, Alright, so again, overview, introduction, principles, systems engineering, systems thinking, uh, Goldratt's theory of constraints and thinking process, soft systems methodology, uh, measurement, vulnerability, resilience, inventive problem solving, the strategic plan, from orienters to indicators to goals, Shannon's evaluation function. Uh, Shannon was the, one of the pioneers in the early days of computer chess. I'm not so familiar with Goldrot, but Shannon, for sure, we've heard of. Everybody knows who Shannon is. Claude Shannon, I believe. Um, it's been forever since I've had to touch on that, but very, very um, uh, well-recognized figure in the field. Uh, the positional valuation function and results. And by the way, this concept of having a positional valuation function is nothing new, but just the way in which um, this appears to be based on mobility of pieces um, and stressors and stability and such probably has something new to it. So we're still going to learn things from this and then question in the last eight years what's become of this 
and what problems still have yet to be solved. The complexity present to the game of chess often hinders planning efforts and makes simple questions like what's going on and which side has the better position difficult to answer. Indeterminate and unexpected events in the near future may make revisions necessary for these plans, often after only a few moves have been played. How true is that? Just think about that. Um, yeah, how often do you watch a chess game and things evolve in a very different direction than you would have expected? Or how often are you playing a game and it just just veers off in a completely different direction. Um, so yeah, there's some need to be flexible. Um, so we theorize that these uh, dynamic planning models based on perceptions of constraints, the management of stress, the readiness of resources to support strategy, resiliency, uh, sustainable development, and sensitivity, both incremental progress towards goals and the emergence of new opportunities can be used with greater success. We seek positions which can serve as a platform for future success in a future that is often uncertain. All right. A proposed heuristic for a machine playing the game of chess, taking advantage of concepts from multiple disciplines, can be used to better estimate the potential of resources to support strategy and to offer better insight for determining whether progress is being made toward remote goals. Um, in a future that's uncertain, there's a benefit to develop a strategic position full of resilience, flexibility, and structure with the potential of seizing new opportunities as they change. As we evaluate each game position, we now consider the potential to exploit and respond to new opportunities as time passes and new situations emerge beyond our initial planning horizon. Our flexibility ideally allows a smooth and resilient response to concurrent, adempts, uh, concurrent events as they unfold. We theorize that the focus of the constraints, as well as the development of a resilient position, is a more useful level of abstraction for our game-playing machine. We examine concepts and values useful for playing a positional game of chess. We develop a perception use useful for measuring incremental progress towards goals and then look at positions in chess games where the heuristic often there's insight not otherwise obtainable. We conclude that our evaluation heuristic offers promise for a machine playing a game of chess, although our limited evidence at present consists of diagrams showing the strategic or dynamic potential of the game pieces. Hmm. I wouldn't necessarily consider strategic and dynamic the same thing, but okay. Um, we see the chess position as a complex ad adaptive system full of opportunities of emergence from interacting pieces. Our aim in this paper is to re-engineer the work performed by our machine, mindful of the values commonly aligned by experts and the principles of systems thinking so that it might be done in a far superior way. Okay. Fair enough, that's the overview. Perhaps a bit long, perhaps I don't quite get it. Um, one thing that does stand out as a marker here is we examine concepts and values useful for playing a positional game of chess and develop a perception useful for measuring incremental progress towards goals. And then actually do the measurement and see um, what insights we have now available to us. I'm not sure I follow everything that was saying here, but um, perhaps more references to other materials may help here. I'm not sure. Maybe we don't need an overview. I don't know. Let's go into the introduction. This paper is concerned with heuristic algorithms. According to Cohen 3 a uh, heuristic is anything that provides a plausible aid or direction in the solution of a problem, but is in the final analysis unjustified and capable of justification and potentially fallible. Heuristics help solve unsolvable problems 
uh, or reduce the time needed to find a satisfactory solution. A new heuristic is proposed, which offers better insight on the uh, positional placement of the pieces to a chess playing computer program. This heuristic will have usefulness in the evaluation function of a computer program or just as part of a teaching tool which explains to a human user the reasons that one side or the other has an advantage in a chess game. This is why I'm interested in the article. I think it has tremendous teaching potential, assuming that there is some level of rigor and assuming there are in fact insights that have some value. But also I think that uh, probably in the last eight years um, this author is probably not the only person to have made these discoveries. So uh, this leaves me very curious as to um, what has been solved and what has not been solved in the last decade. The heuristic involves constructing a table of the future mobility of each piece, taking into account the other pieces on the board as well as the likely constraints that those pieces place on the future movement. The heuristic concept is described and then examples are presented from a software application constructed to demonstrate the concept. Computer chess programs have historically been weak in understanding concepts relating to positional issues. The proposed heuristic offers a method to potentially play a stronger positional game of chess. <clears throat> understanding the principles of positional chess is a necessary starting point before designing so concepts useful for machine implementation. We select the relevant concepts of positional chess, which have been addressed by multiple authors. Um, do you really want me to read this all aloud? I wonder. Um, activity of the pieces. Um, yeah, I think a list probably would have helped with this sort of thing. But I think also the examples will elucidate what's going on here. But for completeness sake, let's read it. Um, Stean02, Steen02, I don't know, declares that the most important single feature of a chess position is the activity of the pieces, and the primary constraint on a piece's activity is the pawn structure. Uh, Zono Bernarski. Uh, how do I pronounce it? Zno, Znoskobrovsky, 80. I've certainly heard of that chess player. Generalizes this principle by declaring that uh, if a piece attacks another, it is not the weaker, but the stronger one which has to give way. Ryshevsky, uh, 02, notes that a good or a bad bishop depends on the placement of the pawns. Are we not going to just like loop in Philidor here and talk about pawns are the soul of chess and all that while we're at it. I mean, yeah, these are all good practical concerns. The placement of your pieces versus the placement of your pawns um, is very important, and many people have asked many key questions about this. Levy76, I assume that's the how computers play chess? Unless Levy wrote something else. But um, How Computers Play Chess wasn't written until much afterwards, so I'm curious what he wrote in 76. But he discusses a game where a computer program accepts a position with an extra piece out of play, uh, making a win difficult, if at all possible. Our evaluation should therefore... well, okay, yes. Our evaluation should therefore consider the degree to which a piece is is in play or is capable of forcibly contributing to the game. Um, Steen defines a weak pawn as one which cannot be protected by another pawn, therefore requiring support from its own pieces. This is the ability to be protected by another pawn, not necessarily the present existence of such protection. Steen declares that the pawn structure has a certain capacity for efficiently accommodating pieces and that exceeding that capacity hurts their ability to work together. Uh, capacity for efficiently... Oh yeah, well yeah, if you're cramped, um, your pawn or your pawn structure is in such a way that your pieces can't maneuver around the pawns, you've exceeded the capacity provided by your pawns, that's called a space deficit. That is quite important. A guard, O3, 
uh, declares that all positional chess is related to the existence of weakness in either player's position. This weakness becomes real when it's possible for the weakness to be attacked. Pieces on their board and uh, constraining interactions define how attackable these weaknesses are. He's not the first to propose that, but okay, yes. Um, I mean, he might be the first to put it in such a superlative term, but yeah, okay, whatever. M's O1 declares that an advantage of piece is performing several important functions at once, while a disadvantage uh, if a piece is not uh, participating effectively in the game. M's teaches that double pawns can be weak if they're attackable or otherwise reduce the mobility of the pawns. Double pawns can control vital squares, which might also mean denying mobility to enemy pieces. Isolated pawns require the presence of pieces to defend them if attacked. And if you'll find that, like, a lot of these pawn structure sorts of things are coded into Stockfish, as are many of the other of these concepts. And um, we'll see how this measures up. I'm actually more curious now, and I probably can't, in the space of this stream, do a full analysis, but measuring apples versus apples and just seeing... Um, what Stockfish does and doesn't measure, and comparing that to what this proposed um, engine measures could be interesting. Davretsky96 argues that creating multiple threats is a good starting point for forming a plan. Uh, improving the performance of the weakest piece is, an is proposed as a good way to improve your position as a whole. That's, yeah, Davretsky's right. That's a core principle that I've been applying throughout my chess development. Um, so yeah, for what it's worth, uh, creating multiple threats. <laughs> uh, some of you who play chess on some online sites might be familiar um, with Grandmaster Komarov, uh, who cites through Kasparov uh, the same principle, that making many threats... Um, will induce blunders from your opponent. Um, but that's kind of a crude way of putting it. Just in general, grandmasters throughout all time have been arguing in favor of um, making threats and having active pieces. Um, McDonald 06 is an example of good double pawns which operate to restrict the mobility of the opponent's pieces and are not easily attackable. His view is that every position needs uh, to be evaluated according to the unique features present. Capablanca, O2, and Znoborowski, Znosko Borowski, 80, speak of the force of the chess pieces. Uh, speak of how the force of the chess pieces acts in space over the chessboard and through time in sequential moves. Critical is the concept of position, which is valued by greater or lesser mobility, plus the pressure exerted against points on the board or against opponent's pieces. Prominence, according to, or preeminence, according to Capablanca, should be given to the element of position. Um, we are also instructed that the underlying principle of the middle game is coordinating the action of our pieces. Yes. Yeah, these are not the only two authors to have um, heavily stressed this point. Um, that, well, how do I sum up what they've said? Um, mobilizing your pieces, limiting the mobility of your opponent's pieces, it's very important. Um, you don't want to have an attack while some of your pieces are immobile unless you can see in very concrete terms that that attack just wins. Generally speaking, you need to mobilize your pieces. You aren't able to mobilize them fast enough. Or you aren't able to mobilize just a, a couple of them and have them independently operate effectively in most positions although there are exceptions where a couple pieces just break through your opponent's position and run roughshod over it and 
cause all sorts of problems. That's the exception rather than the rule. And the rule would be develop all your pieces and then mobilize them um, against targets or against just trying to have as much space and mobility as possible so you have the flexibility of striking an attack anywhere at any time. Heisman discusses the important elements of positional valuation, including global mobility of the pieces and flexibility. I assume by global mobility what's meant is something something akin to mobility as we generally think of it in the middle game, but not in the middle game. Um, because it's quite rare in the middle game that you'll have a piece that will shuffle all the way around the board, although that does happen. Generally, this concept of global mobility, I, I would think, would apply to positions where you move a piece and then move it again and again and again. And there's a question of how far can this particular piece go over a very long span of time when the opponent has a free hand to do anything, as do we. Um... Albus one has written that uh, the key to building uh, practical intelligence systems lies in our ability to focus attention on what's important and ignore what's not. Okay. Kaplan 78 says that it's un that it's important to focus attention on the few moves that are relevant and to spend a little time on the rest. Positional style is distinguished by positional goals and evaluation, which rewards pieces for future potential to accomplish objectives. Um, Ulya O2 quotes um, chess player Katzen Lin Boygen. Katzen Lin Boygen is saying that the goal of positional style chess is the creation of a position which allows for the development of a future or in the future, by selecting appropriate uh, a placement of pieces, combinations freely will emerge. Wait, really? I'm questioning the use of these sources. It seems like, yes, we're citing quite a few sources that have written things, um, but that's been said for ages. Has it not? Um... Well, I guess putting it in terms of a positional style of chess, as opposed to um, by appropriately developing your pieces, combinations occur. I mean, was it not Lasker who said, like, something about burying the germs of defeat? I want to look this up, but I don't want to get sidetracked too far. Um, but he further describes the organizational strategy of creating flexible structures and the need to create potential in need to create potential in adaptive systems that uh, face an unpredictable environment as opposed to inadaptive we need to create potential in adaptive systems that face a unpredictable environment so okay fair enough we're talking about systems again Botvinnik and Botvinnik I guess in 84 and 70 attempt in general terms, to describe a vision for implementing long-range planning, noting that attacking the paths that pieces take toward objectives is a viable positional strategy. Wait, Bob Vinick said that? Um, surely we need a greater context there, right? But anyway, positional play uh, aims at changing or constraining the attack paths that pieces take when moving towards objectives in effect, creating or mitigating stress in the position. Hubbard, 07, uh, identifies procedures which can be helpful when attempting to measure intangible values, such as the positional pressure produced by the chess pieces. Wait, how do we know that's intangible? Or are we just assuming it? Uh, Spitzer 07 declares that what gets measured gets managed, that everything that should be measured can be measured, 
and that we should measure what is most important. Okay, we've gotten three sections into this paper. Lots of ideas floating about. I feel like... Well, I don't need my ideas. My ideas are boring. Let's keep going. A system, according to Kosyakov, sorry, I misread that. The system Kosyakov 03 is a set of interrelated components working together toward a common objective. A complex engineered system is composed of a large number of intricately interrelated diverse elements. Uh, von, uh, I feel like I should know some of these things, but I did not major in systems. So, um, pardon me if I butcher some of these names. Um, von Berdanafli. Uh, no, Von Berdal, uh, B E R T A L A N F F I Y. Von Bertel Anafi. Bertel Anfi. Okay, Von Bertel Anfi is of the opinion that the concept of a system is not limited to material entities but can be applied to any whole consisting of interacting components. This description could apply to the situation faced by an agent playing a game where the pieces represent interrelated diverse elements. Um, he further identifies dynamic interaction as the central problem in all fields of reality, uh, which would include playing a game, including system uh, System elements in mutual interaction at the very core it is the very core issue. Additionally, we are told to suspect systems or welcome, or, or we are told to suspect systems or certain systems conditions at work um, whenever we come across something that appears visualistic or human-like in attribution. We are told to suspect systems or certain systems conditions at work whenever we come across something that appears visualistic or human-like in attribution. Um, that sentence could use some revision, but I think that means we are supposed to suspect and what we are supposed to suspect are either systems or certain systems conditions at work whenever we come across something that appears visualistic or human-like in attribution. Um, and suspect is not further qualified, it's just we're supposed to suspect such things. That's okay. And we therefore see an opportunity to apply uh, principles of system theory, in particular systems engineering to game theory. How would we begin? We now apply basic principles of system engineering from Kosyakov 3, a needs analysis phase. It defines the need for a new system. Really? Okay. Yeah, the valid need would be to play a stronger positional game of chess. I guess I appreciate the formality here. Um, that seemed kind of obvious to me that that was the need, but it's good that we apply the formality to it. Okay. The concept exploration phase examines positional system concepts, or potential system concepts. What performance is required uh, to meet the perceived need? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You're telling me in the 37-page paper you're going to answer that. Um, we would answer the first question simply that our software function as an adequate analysis tool capable of selecting high-quality positional moves and left on for indefinite periods of time. Uh, I would argue that's just a really hard question. The paper doesn't need to answer it, and it's kind of bold that the paper, or audacious is probably a better word, to say that the paper is going to answer that. I mean, yes, that's one possible answer. Yes, it's probably the answer people want right now, but it's why pigeonhole yourself?
but okay. Um, so our second question might speculate that a new approach is needed when feasibly we could model humans playing the game. Um, is there at least one feasible approach? To, uh, yeah. The concept definition phase is the preferred concept. It answers the question, what are the key characteristics of a system concept that would achieve the most beneficial balance between capability, operational life, and cost? To answer this question, a number of alternative concepts might be considered, and relative performance, operational utility, development risk, and cost might be compared. Uh, the first concept we might consider would be the Shannon approach, which has been the backbone of software computer chess programs. We present in this paper to find another section, another approach. We therefore decided to explore the concept definition phase in more detail as we look for key system characteristics which conceptually could serve as the base of a new system. Hmm. I'm going to have to look up what this author's done in the last eight years. I'm curious. Um, yeah, the Shannon approach. Is that just referring to the fact that all the chess positions can be numbered and theoretically have some theoretical win-loss or draw value? Um, and that that's not really a practical problem, but... Or not really... While that theoretically solves all chess positions in practice, different approaches are needed. Or is that referring to some other approach? By the backbone, I get that, like, Alpha Beta and Min Max and Nega Scout and all that use this, but anyway. Systems thinking. The heart of systems thinking, which is different from analytical thinking, is an attempt to simplify complexity. Let me get a drink here. Pardon me. Systems thinking is a discipline for observing holes. It's a framework for observing inner relationships rather than things, for, uh, for observing the effects of change rather than static snapshots. The heart of systems thinking, which is different than analytical thinking, is the attempt to simplify complexity. Uh, we see an opportunity to apply principles of systems thinking to game theory. Uh, garage... Uh, let me try that again. Gar... Ajadagi. Uh, uh, I mispronounced that, forgive me. Discusses how independent variables are the essence of analytical thinking. We might find on closer inspection that our independent variables are not truly independent, that the whole is more than a simple sum of the parts. Or one may argue less. <laughs> Emergent uh, properties of a system are a product of interactions and cannot um, be analyzed or manipulated by analytical tools. Wait, what? Emergent properties of a system are a product of interactions and as such cannot be an analyzed or manipulated in analytical tools and do not have causal explanations. You must instead attempt to understand the processes that produce them in managing the critical interactions. One might think of emergent properties as being in the process uh, of the unfolding. What makes it possible to turn the system's approach into a scientific approach is that our belief is that such a thing as approximation or approximate knowledge. Um, Garish Day Gar a j a r g h a r a j e d a g h i garage da he. That's probably most incorrect, and again, forgive me. He informs us that understanding consequences of actions, both short term and long term, in their entirety, requires building a dynamic model to simulate the multiple loop non-linear nature of the system. Uh, our model should aim to capture the important delays and relevant interactions between the major variables, but need not be complicated. 
We therefore attempt, in the construction of evaluation function from a systems perspective, we will look at the interaction of the pieces and their ability to create and miti um, mitigate stress. We adopt constraints, vulnerability, dynamic modeling, and resiliency as higher level concepts which will help cut through the complexity and steer search efforts toward the lines of most promising moves. This technique of modeling is one of the basic tools of system engineering particularly in situations where complexity and emergence obscure the basic facts in a situation. From Anderson, 97, we apply systems thinking to look at the web of interconnected circular relationships present in a chess position. Uh, this is the same thing. Um, confident that this is the proper tool for doing so. Our reason for believing this is that a chess position is dynamic, complex, and interdependent. Things are changing all the time, analysis is messy, and the interactions of the pieces are all interconnected. As we attempt to construct resilient game positions, we follow Tierney 07, identify four system level components of resiliency, robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, um, and rapidity, the capacity to restore or sustain functionality in a timely way. Okay. Um, Cool, I guess. Goldratt's theory of constraints and thinking processes. He's developed a theory of constraints which postulates that organizations and complex systems are hindered from reaching their goals by the constraints placed on the system. Identifying those constraints and removing them can speed progress toward the goals. Uh, Sheinkoff, 99, describes how Goldratt's that's a typo right there. Goldrots Institute began to modify the original concepts to serve the needs of clients who wanted generalized procedures to solve a wider variety of problems outside of a factory production environment. Goldrots ideas, while seemingly social... Am I going to really read this section? Identify the constraints, and then removing the constraints can speed progress toward the goals. I, I'm not reading this. Uh, I accept the premise, okay? You don't have to convince me that removing constraints, whatever. Okay. Section 7, soft systems. Um, so... Uh, Checklando 6 presents a modified systems methodology where complexity and confusion are tackled through organized exploration and learning. Modified systems methodology where complexity and confusion are tackled uh, and they're tackled by way of organized exploration and learning. We envision the continuous change present in the game of chess as a complex a state that needs to be at least partially understood to make exploration efforts um, more efficient. And we conceptualize a learning agent which gathers relevant information as it seeks to determine the cumulative stress in the position in order to determine the paths of exploration. The ones which... Okay. Okay. That isn't a novel concept Okay, cool. Curiously, our evaluation function will become a methodology rather than a formula. We'll share bot Vinix puzzlement with an evaluation number. <laughs> nice! Nice, we share bot Vinix puzzlement with an evaluation number. What we need is an insightful and informed direction for exploration and a notion for how pressing this direction becomes strategically. Yes. Yeah, I think Bob Vinick had some 
practical or pragmatic advice and that while Shannon might be right that every position does have a number, um, it's not something you or I are ever going to understand. We have our own relative ways of looking at positions and we might even have multiple ways that we can look at the same position. Um, and these ways that we look at these could have constructive or de destructive with other ways that we look at it. But um, as far as a single number representing a position, that's not productive. And that's kind of why I'm looking at this article, because I think um, this might have some insight. I don't know. We'll find out. The insight that we attain um, by this methodology, really, spring for action um, as our software agents decide what it needs to do next after completing the current evaluation. Our evaluation ideally produces candidate directions for exploration as part of a carefully constructed strategic plan it indicates which parts are critical and which parts can wait till later. So we're on page eight and I was expecting something very different. Um, I suppose by the time I get to page 16, I'll have a different expectation entirely, but yeah, I thought this was about a way of evaluating a chess position. And now we're pivoting to something else. Okay, you duped me, but we're eight pages in, so let's keep going. <laughs> it's a sunk cost, but we gotta keep going. Um... Our model is an intellectual device we use to richly explore the future using stress transformation as the chosen strategy or worldview. Yeah, so you mentioned how there was stressors in a position and resiliency and so forth, and great. Our estimate of the winning chances in a candidate position critically depends on the identification and exploration of the critical candidate sequence of moves and the correct classification of the worthiness timely exploration of the candidate positions. A heuristic estimate of the cumulative stress present in the position at the end of our principal variation can be correlated, if desired, with winning chances. However, our operational use of the value is um, for cybernetically steering search efforts. I kind of get what you're saying here. Um... So, for what it's worth, there have been people who have made proposals that are contrary to this. Um, one of whom, in most dramatically declared, that he's going to write some algorithm and some formula, and you just be able to look at a chess position, identify some variables in this static chess position, and produce a number. And that by producing these numbers, um, you'd be able to identify the best move. And this paper takes a different approach, stating that, well, we actually have to do some searching. There's no way to actually just produce a number and say, yeah, okay, the best move is based on this number. It's the move number five. You got to move the knight to the square. Um, or if there is something like that, um, out of the millions uh, or more chess players, none of us have found that way of looking at a chess position. So it's unlikely, though possible, that chess could be reduced to a math problem. Um, it's been done with like macros and database triggers and stuff, but all those involve some searching too. All right, so. Yeah, what gets measured gets managed. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. So we got to measure stuff, and then we got to manage it, and it's going to be great. And we're just going to do all the measuring and managing. Um, and you want to identify the perception that's simplest, that correctly models what's going on. I don't. I mean, that's something that itself, the complexity of your model can itself be measured and managed, and you can refine that down to a simpler model. 
uh, alternative view is presented by Gunderson, who declares that his experience is suggested to be ruthlessly parsimonious and economical as possible while still retaining responsiveness to the management objectives and actions appropriate for the problem. Um, so, wait, is there actually something that that's contrary to in this section? Um, Hmm. Uh, this idea of producing a sensor, and we must construct a valid sensor and such. Well, how do you prove the validity of the sensor? What would you sense in a chess game that would be of value? And how do you prove, not just out of like practical practice or something, but how do you prove that a sensor is valid? That's kind of hard. And that's probably why it's going with this alternative view. Uh, just be ruthlessly parsimonious and economical while retaining uh, responsiveness for management objectives. So, must aim to simplify. Well, yeah, we have to aim to simplify the model because we can't prove the validity of any given sensor. That'd be mad. So we'll stick with what we know, and that's how to make a simple model. So that's fine. Um, vulnerability. Critical in the success of a computer chess program is the attempts to play in the positional style is the concept of vulnerability. The pieces and structures uh, that are or have the potential to become vulnerable will become a focus of our search and exploration efforts and will serve as targets for our long range planning. Uh, we follow McCarthy. And one and conceptualized vulnerability is a function of exposure, um, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Consequently, the sensor we develop should attempt to measure exposure to threats, sensitivity to the effects of stimuli, and the ability to adapt and cope with the consequences of change. We envision a sensor that produces a forecast of potential vulnerability as an output. This forecast can guide exploration efforts uh, by identifying targets for the useful application of stress and serve as one indicator of a promising position. You can sense if your opponent's position is under stress, right? Um, still curious how they're going to define that, but um, I guess we'll find out when we get there. Any machine-based attempt to zero in on vulnerability that does not address this conceptual base runs the risk of missing opportunities. You don't say. <laughs> a missed opportunity might equally prevent us from increasing positional pressure on the opponent. This is actually a missed point to a lot of chess players. And again, it seems pretty basic, but if you're not playing the best moves, if you're not stressing your opponent, putting your pieces on the best possible squares, um, you're missing opportunities, and a missed opportunity could eventually translate into you missed another opportunity and now your opponent's pressuring your position, or has won the game. Um, because you just missed too much. Hey Zwish, how's it going? I'm just reading through this academic paper. Um, this is developed, or this is authored. Yeah, there we go. Uh, did I misspell that? It's very possible I misspelled that. Either way, um, there it is. This is independently authored by John Mares. I'm not familiar with the author. Having a good, joyful time reading through it. Um, I'm how many pages I'm into this? I'm on page ten, and I'm still struggling to see like a single example of what he's talking about. He's talking very methodological here, so this is pretty... Hmm. Methodology has generally not been my MO, we'll just say. So, it's been an entertaining read for me, but... Yeah, so I was just talking about here, he's mentioning there's this concept of if you're missing opportunities in a chess position, you're not putting all your pressure you can on your opponent, and if you're not doing that, um, they're not going to blunder. So you got a um, the valuation of a chess position or its winning chances uh, has to be might not be accurate 
unless you're exploring the correct possibilities in the position which threaten the opponent's position and apply pressure to it. We conceptualize the reduction of vulnerability in the pursuit of sustainable development in interrelated aims. Uh, resilience. Vulnerability is the condition that makes adaptation and resilience necessary as a mitigation. Um, I thought I was going to have the word strategy in here somewhere, but apparently not. Um, the scientific study of resilience began in the 1970s. Okay. Is that really true? I don't know. The scientific study of resilience, I guess in a scientific sense that could have been true. Began in the 1970s when um, Norman Garmitzi started well-adapted well children who had overcome the stress of poverty. Resilience is also an important research area in military uh, science and in the study of ecosystems. We find this useful in game theory. Um, yeah, p some chess positions are resilient. I still want to see how we measure this. Uh, in our view, um, adapted from Luthar, resilience refers to ongoing dynamic developmental process of strategically positioning resources that enables the player of a game to negotiate current issues adaptively. It also provides a formulation for dealing with subsequent challenges as well as recovering from reverses of fortune. Uh, we design a generic continuous ability or desired generic continuous ability during crisis and non-crisis game situations to cope with the uncertain possibilities that arrive from beyond our planning horizon. Okay, fair enough. Um, desire generic continuous ability both during crisis and non-crisis situations to cope with the uncertain da 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 da. It's the same thing. Okay, whatever. Ideally, we seek to create a positional uh, pressure to force the arriving positions to be in our favor or minimally to put a cage of restraints around the enemy pieces. Flexibility, adaptive capacity, and effective engagement of available resources will be our weapons against the dynamic charges which will unfold in our game. Ideally, or dynamic changes which will unfold in our game. Uh, ideally, we will look for and manage the heuristic early warning signs of a position approaching a tipping point. And being able to detect a tipping point is a pretty pivotal thing in chess, too. Um, it would have been cool if the author had talked about that at all. But anyway, reaching a tipping point where a distinct, clear advantage for one side emerges from an unclear array of concurrent peace interactions. And just to be clear here, an unclear array of current peace interactions describes like 95% of um, my over-the-board tournament chess play. Like, my games in particular are extremely unclear to everybody watching, which is pretty hilarious, but also leaves something to be desired. Because, you know, at some point, it's difficult to produce good positions on demand if you don't understand what you're doing. So I'm trying to find some more structure in my own game personally, but um, yeah, there are quite a few positions in general which are very unclear. Um, generally, the higher up you go on the chess ladder and the chess rating system, um, the more interesting positions you'll discover. Um, the failure to include resilience measurements like this and planning efforts might cause a house of card effect. Yeah, um, that's true if you like try to play just like an engine and the engine tells you Ooh, play that thing it's plus three and then like five moves later you have no idea what's going on that's not a good situation. So having some concept of resilience or what your position's capable of in general having some positional understanding uh, is a good thing unless you see the winning line in which case just go for it but having an AI that has a concept of um, resilience I don't know 
there are some positions which can only be solved by giving up resilience and playing a very forcing variation that at the end of the variation it produces a pleasant position but there are a number of lines where you have to do things that um, reduce your resilience so central concept is the construction of a resilient position one that ideally position possesses a capacity to bounce back from okay really yeah now that's the definition of resilience that's cool uh, that uh, produces advantageous moves in light of small stakes by our opponent or permits us to postpone our search efforts at early points um, for less promising positions with greater confidence uh, that will have sufficient resources. That's a tact I've actually used in my games where I think I see a move, I think it's the best move, and then I see another move. And I'm like, you know, this doesn't look as good as the first move that I was looking at, but I'm pretty sure I understand this second position, and I don't understand that first one. So I'm going to pick the position with higher confidence, even though I don't think it's necessarily the best move. Now, if you have enough time to think about it, eventually you'll pick whatever is in your mind best. But if you're not sure about what's going on, sometimes you'll do some retreating something or other, or otherwise compromise on your attack. Um, and... Um, Often that's a good pragmatic move in a high pressure situation. I'm not saying that AIs have to do that, but yeah. Uh, when change occurs, the components that make up resilience provide the necessary capacity to minimally counter and ideally seize new opportunities that emerge. Resilience is minimally uh, an insurance against the collapse of the position, and ideally an investment that pays dividends in the forms of better future positions. With no pun intended, we see the strength, and we see the struggle to control um, the unknown, emerging future positions as a red queen's race, where in tough fought games um, against a talented opponent, it might take all the effort possible to maintain equal chances and extraordinary efforts um, involving hundreds of hours per move such in correspondence games might be required to maneuver to an advantage. Um, okay, fair enough. I get this concept of resilience. It's something that we've all at some point, well not all of us, but almost all of us, everybody's played in a tournament at some point or has played many over-the-board tournaments, knows what it means to have a resilient opponent. And often themselves knows what it means to be resilient even if you think you're going to lose. Um, let's see. Scan through it. The diagrams of influence and constraint look something like a neural network like Leela will find automatically. Yeah, so my... What got me interested in this paper, I was searching for... Uh, chess and proximal policy optimization and seeing if somebody had done anything with that. So chess and PPO, proximal policy optimization. And somehow a search engine popped up with this paper instead. And this is a 2010 paper which predates um, uh, what DeepMind did at least publicly. So I'm curious, like, to what extent some of these things might still be unsolved, and to what extent some of these metaphorically might describe things, or allegorically, or... I'm not thinking of the right word, but describe what Leela is doing, as well as future chess engines that might try different policies. Um, uh, so resilience is the basic strength, suggesting that incidents... Oh, it's the basic strength. Um, Holnagel suggests that incidents, which for us might be the construction of short sequences, um, might reveal insight to boundary conditions where resilience is either causing this, them to stretch or depth or buckle and fail. Emergency response teams might use practice incidents to measure resilience as unforeseen events 
emerge during operations, uh, fire drills, random audits, and security searches, even surprise tests are diagnostic tools used to detect and correct situations lacking in resilient capacities. And similarly in chess, you can search uh, some sample variations, not that they're necessarily what are the best variations in a given position, not necessarily that they're even in the given position, they might be in a similar position, or could just be a generic search in general. Um, and you could look at some things just by way of analogy and draw conclusions that way too. Um, uh, we acknowledge the reality that our ability to handle an unexpected move or critical situation in a game depends on the structures already in place. Uh, we desire to pay close attention to weak signals of failure, to weak signals of failure that are diagnostic indicators of potential problems in the system. We also perform diagnostic probing to uncover and steer gameplay toward positions where there are multiple good moves, an additional sign of resilience. Yeah, and this is something that I'm surprised they didn't find a chess master supporting that concept too, for all the chess quotes there are in here. Um, it seems like Lasker would have something to say about that. We speculate the ability to construct a resilient position and the ability to perceive stress in a position are two primary conceptual differences between a game-playing man and machine. Um, that's an interesting speculation. We believe that these abilities to be emulated through the use of custom diagnostic tests, or emulated through use of custom diagnostic tests. Okay, humans construct resilient positions almost by instinct and often without conscious thought, according to Fritz. In diverse situations, such as driving automobiles, playing sports games, conducting warfare, social interaction, and you know, great. That's an interesting thing. Um, if you want to take a look, this guy looked at how a neural network sees. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. Uh, concepts like territory and influence and go. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Why don't I skip over some of this? Because it's getting pretty dry. Um, even if I accept what he's saying, it's still pretty dry. And I'm curious where the actual testing takes place here. We agree and conceptualize that while risk factors do not automatically lead to negative outcomes, their presence only exposes a game playing agent to circumstances associated with a higher incidence of the outcome. Protective or mitigating factors uh, such as constraints, can contribute to positive outcomes, perhaps regardless of the risk status. Great, great, inventive problem solving. Our chess program attempts to be, like MacGyver, an inventive problem solver. We see effective problem solving as an adaptive process that unfolds based on the nature of the problem, rather than series of specific steps. Uh, we agree with acknowledging the difference, or with Brown, O2, that acknowledging the difference between uh, what's important and what isn't is a basic starting point. Huh. Well, okay. We're on page 13. We're talking about the starting point. Great. Um... We attempt to navigate an exponentially growing search tree, selecting those paths or exploration that are promising, interesting, risk mitigating, and resilient in the face of an unknown future. We are concerned at all times the potential of a position to serve as an advancing platform for future incremental progress towards positional goals. We will accomplish this by knowing the outcomes we want and looking tirelessly for them. Um, Savransky lists three major requirements for a problem-solving methodology. It should focus on the most appropriate and strongest solutions. It should produce as an output the most promising strategies. 
It should acquire and use important, well-organized, and necessary information at all steps of the process. And it should focus on gathering the important information, information which characterizes the problem and makes it clear, including contradictions. Any simplifications we perform should aim at reducing the problem to its essence and be directed toward our conceptual strategic solution. Okay. Ah, uh, as an example, typical American news. Yeah, okay. That, 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 that. Strategic plan. I want an example now. I want an example now. To quote that child from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I want it now. I'm trying to remember the child's name. But she was great. Um, yeah, you want promising candidate moves and the chances of sustainable development in the position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peace, threat, stack. That's a stack there. Yeah, it's a simplified model. Great. Delay. Okay, stress, coping. Yeah, we want to identify the stress present by examining the demands of each stressor and the capacity of each player to respond to the demands and the consequences of not responding to demands. And part of that might be actually analyzing games by real players um, and measuring real stress and real mistakes and such. But maybe this takes on a more theoretical point of view and just says, we're just going to talk about this abstractly, and I don't know. Um, along the way, we'll need to make assumptions about whether or not the stress we're inflicting our opponent is increasing or de decreasing, and whether or not it's effective or ineffective. We might explore promising paths in detail to confirm our assumptions or might just rely on our measurements of resilience. Critical in our ability to focus our search effect uh, efforts on lines that are promising with regard to um, with regard to oriented application of stress and the predicted effects on future lines of play. Um, oh, critical is our ability to focus. Well, yes, we need to focus. That's definitely true. Um, specifically, we follow and aim for three fundamental characteristics. We want to find stressors and constraints present. Yep, yep, yep. We want to um, identify a reward for values of positional chess and develop the ability to improve, improvise solutions based on what resources are available to us in any given position. We seek to prepare for an unknown future that can be influenced by a strategic placement of resources at present. Um, and the generalized exchange of pieces, squares, and opportunities encountered in gameplay, we seek to establish a pressure that has a realistic chance to resolve in our favor. We desire to create and sustain a web of stress which threatens to become real and therefore has the property that is uh, called virtual existence. Our opponent must spend or dedicate resources uh, to contain or adapt to the threats. Even if a particular threat is contained, it nevertheless has participated in the dynamic shaping and influencing the events that emerge and unfold in the game. Namely, you have an opponent and your opponent is reacting to the game so applying stress has yes, some sort of psychokinetic effect or something, I don't know. It forces your opponent to stress throughout the game, and if your opponent doesn't manage their resources well, they might get exhausted before uh, the critical point occurs in a given game. And there are plenty of examples of that sort of thing. Um, you'll see many funny examples of a chess player uh, exploiting a mistake by another chess player. You'll find even sometimes like online players will blitz moves and then having after speedily placed played some moves on the board um, 
you'll see the opponent strike back with this counter move that exploits the blunder that the opponent just made. And often you'll see traps get set. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was, um, there's a streamer out there, Bigfoot, um, who, against a master, uh, noticed that this master on move two was going about just shuffling their pieces on the king's side, going to fianchetto their bishop on the long diagonal. And, bless his heart, Bigfoot like played bishop h3 and then bishop takes bishop, ended up winning a bishop and a rook or something, and his master opponent or, uh, was not very pleased by this. But it's still pretty funny. Um, but yeah, the point is that your opponent... Um, has to keep attentive throughout the game. And so if you're applying stress at critical points in the game um, and your opponent is not fully alert, you can exploit that. Um, but in a game theory sense, this thing about virtual existence um, would be strongly rebuffed by Shannon. But if you're talking about a real game with a real chess opponent and having a real coach training you to play real games, these are this virtual existence stuff about applying pressure to the opponent, focusing throughout the game, playing good moves throughout, and even if some of your ideas don't work, at least this has challenged your opponent, um, does certainly have an effect on what can happen next. Even if you reach the same position by way of two different move orders, one of them could have stressed your opponent more than the other. So, or stressed you differently. Um, so, yep, where possible, we follow the advice of French military strategist Pierre Joseph Bosset and spread out attacking forces over multiple objectives, forcing an adversary to divide his strength and prevent concentration. Such divided forces, a plan with branches, can be concentrated at will, especially if superior mobility is present, as recommended in French military strategist Goulbert. Um, as an end result of this positional pressure and maneuver, we seek what Napoleon sought. Um, this is the nature of strategy that consists of always having more uh, forces at the point of the attack, or the point where one is attacked, than the enemy. Such positions have the possibility of the win of material and are approached from a more tactical perspective, one that our current heuristics handle well. Okay, fair enough. Why didn't you lead your paper with this? This is awesome. This is hilarious. But also provides great context. I mean, yes, this concept of striking in multiple points at the same time I hate to break it to you, these aren't the only military experts out there, but also, I mean, yeah, you've spelled out clearly what it is you aim to do. So uh, we're on page 18, and I look forward to seeing how we handle it. From orienters to indicators to goals, we identify and adapt the approach of Bossel and Bossel and Mueller uh, to conceptualize the health and evaluation of a chess position. Yep, yep, yep. So we need um, existence and subsistence, effectiveness, freedom of action, security, adaptability, and coexistence. I want to see a chess program that only applies these concepts. Existence, subsistence, effectiveness, freedom of action, security, adaptability, and coexistence. I want to see that program and just how it plays chess and how it eventually evolves to do the same thing as other chess programs. Um, but I want to see how that works. I think that could be entertaining and perhaps if you parameterize it could actually maybe model human behavior. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, you got to assure that all those properties exist in order to have a satisfactory position. Okay, can we, I want an example. 
Sorry. Er, yeah, there's Shannon's evaluation function. Um, is this what I think it is? I often have trouble figuring out what to do when there's no direct sequence of moves leading to placement of pieces on better squares. Oh wait, Shannon had a chess program. He didn't just have a numbering system. He actually made a, an algorithm for the game, if I remember right. So that's what they're talking about, is just conventional chess programs these days uh, follow in Shannon's footsteps. Um, so stress produced by the Shannon method is not of the type that reduces the coping capacity of the opponent or increases our own resilience, etc., etc. Um, namely, that just because there isn't a forced win doesn't mean that the computer should just give up. But also, there are other search algorithms out there um, than that um, will consider things like the number of nodes in the search tree or other measures of complexity. So there are reasons, um, even in a position where an opponent could defend ideally, there are still reasons to play the what we, you and I would call the best move in the position, even if the engine says that all the moves have the same evaluation, there's still reasons to play good moves. Because um, your uh, human opponent could make mistakes, or even engine opponents can too. Um, not that you should rely on such a thing, but you shouldn't um, be afraid to take your chances if you're winning, unless you risk losing. Uh, positional evaluation function uh, she talks about the oriented positional pressure, cumulative stress on the opponent, even if unresolved at the turn. Da, 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 da. So, this pressure will allow for sustainable development as one component of resilient position. It will not judge pieces by the squares they occupy, but instead by the heuristic estimate of focus stress that they contribute or mitigate in the game. Again, um, I say this for Zush's benefit. I made a program decade ago, longer than a decade ago, that does just this. Um, that um, would fully focus on mobilizing the pieces and going after the king. And you would sack pieces in the opening. It wouldn't care. It was beautiful. It was very effective at Blitz. It's just hilarious to watch it. You think Monte Carlo engines play not just the objectively best moves, but also the practically testing moves, um, since they do average results. Yeah, Monte Carlo, for sure. Um, that's uh, definitely um, something that's more testing than your traditional chess engine. Uh, so you get an evaluation function, the goal which makes a uh, machine more knowledgeable with regard to the positional concepts discussed earlier. In designing our evaluation function, we heed the advice of Dombrowski um, that our evaluation function is our test of effects and consequences um, and is our guiding light in our search for the consequences of our choices. Our evaluation centers on heuristic appraisal of the stress we inflict on the opponent's position and the mitigation of the stress created by the opponent. So perhaps a concept is what's inspired Bobby Allison to race most of the 1982 Dayton 500 without a back bumper. Uh, fell off after contacting another car early in the event. Some drivers accused him of rigging the bumper to intentionally fall off on impact. Uh, the car without a bumper had improved aerodynamics and the forces dynamic change operating over the 500 mile race or supplied the driver with an advantage he used to win. Okay. Um, other examples. Uh, show how small changes combined with other critical abilities in interacting with the dynamic environment can create a performance advantage. We seek in similar fashion to favor uh, certain interacting 
arrangements of pieces because subtle changes can have big effects. Okay. We adapt the vision of how do you pronounce this? Katzelenin Boygen. That we define a potential which measures a structure aimed at forcing events in our favor. We follow the suggestion by Pearl to uh, use a strategy as an evaluation and a relaxed constraint model, one that ideally provides a stream of narrative informative advice for managing the steps that make up a problem solving process and use the insight from Fritz and Sturman that structure influences behavior. In order to more accurately estimate the distant positional pressure produced by the chess pieces as well as to predict the future capability of the pieces and the basic form of planning, Lichen and Shoemaker, um, we create the software equivalent of a diagnostic probe which performs a heuristic estimate of the ability of each piece to cause and to mitigate stress. I'd actually like to see that. How does it work? Um, the objectives we select for the stress will be attacking enemy pieces, constraining enemy pieces, and supporting friendly pieces. Um, to support this strategy, we calculate and maintain this database of potential mobility for each chess piece three moves into the future for each piece in position we evaluate. Hmm. I wonder what kind of search strategy they use here. Although they mention that their evaluation function and their search function are intertwined, which causes me to have some doubts, but I'm still curious about this um, attack and restrain and increase mobility of your own pieces concept. And while the implementation may have its flaws, at least it should offer something here. Uh, we update this mobility database dynamically as we evaluate each new leaf position in our search tree. This database helps us determine the pieces that can be attacked or supported in the future um, from defending uh, to, to do as well as constrained from accomplishing the same activity. Note that the piece mobility we calculate is the means through which we determine the pressure the piece can exert on a distant objective. We therefore see how mobility as a general concept can become a vital holistic indicator of system health and a predictor of sustainable development. Or as I think Lasker put it, that uh, cramped positions bear the germs of defeat or something. Um, I'm probably misquoting Lasker if it was Lasker, but it was something of that sort. Uh, reduce our bonus for each move that takes the piece to accomplish the objective. We then consider restrictions which are likely to constrain the piece as it attempts to make moves that are over the board. For example, let's consider the pieces in the... F oh goodness! Oh goodness! How many pictures? We are on page 23 and we have a picture. This is wonderful. All right, so. Yeah, now if you look at it, like the starting position puts each piece pretty much, I don't know. And on the square where it has the most possibilities of places to develop to next, which is to say that all the pieces are undeveloped on their starting squares. Uh, this reminds me a lot how Feature engineering used to be a big thing in computer vision, whereas nowadays CNNs find the features with no work added. This is the same thing, it's just feature engineering. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes some sense. That modern uh, technology supplants um, clever proposed heuristics and evaluation functions and such that machines can automate these sorts of things and that this becomes dated um, the minute that machines actually start automating this sort of thing whether or not it's um, consciously done. Now there's still some point in comparing taking out all the systems related aspects of this or not necessarily constraining yourself with all the systems aspects of this but also looking at 
um, is there some way that we can compare the core concepts of how this works versus how um, neural networks and such work and what is lost by using a neural network that maybe this can still achieve and how can the neural network be adapted to do that too but also maybe this solves a different problem than neural networks solve maybe somehow I'm not sure maybe somehow this could be used to help with um, just training humans to play better I don't know yeah it's interesting from a theoretical perspective um, especially because well yeah and the author never could have known that uh, AlphaGo and such would be coming around the corner and that machine learning was going to be ramping up so quickly um, but yeah this is feature engineering again I produced something very similar to this and this is your three move map and you generate bonuses for pieces being on squares stockfish actually has a piece square table which is dynamically generated um, and I don't think fish test or the stochastic perturbation or the simultaneous perturbation stochastic algorithm by Professor Spall, I don't think that had been ramped up to the point where it is today where it generates the piece square tables. So you don't you have to think about this, it's just automatic. It's generated over a series of thousands of self-play games. Or millions or whatever. Um, but still the the from a theoretical perspective it's exciting. So yep, here's your th restrictions like uh, in the corner you can go here in one move to any of the yellow squares in two moves. This is actually kind of creative uh, in the sense that if you are familiar with how a knight moves it alternates color each time it moves so that allows them to make, create this nice checkerboard effect based on where it's standing in G1. This would not look so beautiful if you were trying to show demonstrate this for the mobility of a pawn or the mobility of a bishop or something like that where potentially it could have ended up on a square by way of multiple different paths. And some of the squares to get to that given square might have been attacked so the mobility could be constrained in that way as well. Um, but yeah, they do talk about how they reduce the bonuses. Alright, so we decided to reward pieces for a potential ability to accomplish uh, worthwhile positional objectives attacking or constraining enemy pieces, defending friendly pieces, attacking squares near our opponent's king, minimizing our opponent's ability to attack squares near our own king, attacking pieces that are not defended or pawns that cannot be defended by neighboring pawns, restricting the mobility of enemy pieces, specifically our ability to accomplish objectives, etc. This way we're getting real about what the piece um, can do. The bonus we give the piece is one. A more precise estimate of the piece's ability to uh, become strategically entangled with respect to uh, causing or mitigating stress and two operationally um, based on real things present in, on the chessboard. In this way, our positional evaluation function will obtain insight not usually obtained by a computer chess program and allow our machine to take positive constructive action. It's still an estimate, but the goal here is to focus our search efforts on likely moves in a positional style of play and evaluate uh, positions from a more positional point of Wait, did I read that right? The goal here is to focus our search efforts on unlikely moves in a positional style of play and to evaluate positions from a more positional point of view. Uh, that's perhaps not the cleanest way that could have been phrased. Um, so, conclusion notwithstanding, they want to measure things that happened or are real things on the chessboard 
and they want to measure potential uh, for strategic engagement. I think they were missing the word synergy in here somewhere too, but um, so what they, what does the evaluation function look like for the post, post heuristic? Um, we model and therefore estimate the positional pressure of our pieces by two-step process. You determine the unrestricted future mobility of each piece. You determine the estimate the operating range or level of engagement of the pieces by determining the limiting factors or constraints that bound that mobility. That's an interesting approach. What page are we on? We're on page 24. So yeah, I think this paper could have been a lot shorter. Not that it has to be. There's a lot the author has to say. But I think this is an interesting um, heuristic that you measure the potential mobility based on where the piece is, where all the pawns are at, and so forth. And then you measure the operating range or level of engagement um, things that restrict the piece's mobility from what it should optimally be capable of doing. All right. This concept of using limiting factors is briefly mentioned in Blanchard in the context of systems engineering. Lukey argues that an important aspect of cognitive appraisal is the extent to which stress-causing agents are perceived or controlled. Or perceived as controlled. Um, balancing processes such as constraints seek to counter when the reinforcing loops. Yeah, okay, so you've got all this theory about what constraints are. Um, what doesn't surprise me much that there's not much talk of the word sacrifice because this paper concerns itself with positional chess as opposed to um, what could happen in short-term continuations that involves sacrificing pieces either for short-term or long-term gain. Now this paper does concern itself with um, short continuations of moves where the game is immediately obvious. Um, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really clarify the same way that machine learning with Monte Carlo or um, various other techniques um, doesn't really clarify what this doesn't cover, I guess, that more modern techniques would. Um, and I can't fault it for that because the author couldn't have known. Um, and he does repeatedly qualify what it is that they're doing here. And it's kind of a squishy problem they're trying to solve. Which is why I'd kind of hope that rather than talking about this allegorically, well, let me try to get through this allegorically. And maybe there will be some benefit to it after all. Limiting factors is briefly mentioned by Blanchard in the context of systems engineering. Um, Lukey argues the important aspect of cognitive appraisal is the extent to which such stress causing agents are perceived or controlled. Balancing processes are such as constraints such to count, seek to counter the reinforcing loops created by a piece and causing stress, which if unconstrained could potentially create even more stress, perhaps in combination with other pieces. Once we, uh, once we have identified the limiting factors, we more easily examine them to discover which ones can be altered to make progress possible. These become strategic factors. Again, being able to identify just these could be a useful exercise in itself, even if there is no larger aim. Uh, the consideration of constraints is part of the decision protocol uh, by Orasanu and Connolly, um, which also includes the identification of resources and goals facing the decision maker. 
We therefore reduce the bonus for accomplishing objectives, um, such as attacking an enemy piece or defending a friendly piece, if the required moves can only be traced through squares that are likely to result in the piece being captured before it could accomplish the objective. We can also reduce the engagement bonus for mobility traced through squares where the piece is attacked but not defended. We may use another scheme, such as probability, for determining stress application reduction for piece movement through squares attacked by both friendly and enemy pieces, where we cannot easily resolve whether or not a piece can trace mobility through a square question and therefore create stress. So, yeah, you could use a stochastic or probabilistic model, sure. Um, we think in terms of rewarding a self-organizing capacity to create stress on the varied locations of the pieces and the constraints they face. We reward each piece for its predicted ability to accomplish strategic objectives, exert positional pressure, and restrict the mobility of enemy pieces based on the current set of pieces on the chessboard at the time we are calling our evaluation function. Using anticipation as a strategy can be costly and limited by time constraints can hurt our performance if not done with competence. An efficient compromise between anticipative and reactive strategies would seem to maximize performance. Yeah, what if you have a pinned piece? How do you... Uh, it seems like if you have a queen that's like pinned and potentially could go in three moves to anywhere on the board, but right now it's not moving anywhere. Um, seems like this approach might not necessarily work, but okay. Give a piece an offensive score based on the number and type of enemy pieces we can attack in three moves, more so if unconstrained. We give a defensive score based on how many of our own pieces it can move to defend in three moves, and the ability to mitigate or constrain the attacking potential of enemy pieces. Again, the bonus is reduced for each move it takes to accomplish the objective. The information is derived from the influence diagram and stimulation diagram we just calculated. Extra points can be given for weak or undefended pieces that we can threaten. Yeah, I still think this would be a useful training tool. I'm just curious how an AI using this would work, too. Um, I can also determine king's safety. That doesn't really surprise me using a 9-square template. Interestingly enough, Stockfish uses an 8-square template using pretty much the same technique right here. Um, although castling isn't really a big deal with that. Um, and also, interestingly, I submitted the patch to Stockfish that bumped that up to 8 squares when it's in the corner. Um, or bumped it up to 7. And somebody else came up with a better patch that bumped it up to 8. And ultimately, our patches were almost identical in code. But um, yeah, this, the, this technique here is very useful. And we independently invented it. Which is great. Um, King will come out of hiding naturally when the number of pieces on the board is reduced and the enemy does not have the potential to move... Uh, these reduced number of pieces near our king. We're likewise free to advance the pawns, protecting our king, again, as long as the enemy cannot mount an attack on the monarch. Um, the potential ability of our opponent to mount an attack on our king is the heuristic we use as the basic for king safety. Optionally, we'll consider realistic restrictions that our own pieces can make on an opponent's ability to move pieces near our king. Yeah, so... There's a thing in chess called an end game, and it's the part of the game where you're able to push the pawns around your king, but also to move your king out more aggressively. Um, pawns are rewarded by their chance to reach the last rank, and what they can do, um, uh, defending and attacking pieces, etc. Uh, piece mobility tables that we generate should help us identify pawns that cannot be defended by other pawns or other pieces. Uh, is this weakness that we should penalize? Double and isolated pawns are bad, blockaded, whatever, whatever. I mean, you get the picture. In summary, we've created a model of potential positional. Pr uh, we've created a model of positional pressure 
which can be used in evaluation of a computer chess program. Yep, yep, yep. That's cool. Emphasize that problem solving and thinking revolve around the model we have obtained, process under study. Yeah, for example, maybe don't give those things a score. Maybe they'll keep them as a feature list. Maybe there will be a newer way to, like, um... <laughs> yeah. I, he's gone through great endeavor as an independent scholar to write this write game uh, chess as a systems game. And that's a perspective. Um, I do find it funny, like, he, he's gone through such great length to talk about this game as being a systems game. And then eventually he does get around to a feature identification and then starts talking about things in terms of scores and points and, like, uh, yeah, that's a model. Um, why pigeonhole yourself? Uh, if you'd known that neural networks were going to come along, you could have, like, written this thing that said, you know, we're going to keep track of all the features in the position, and there's going to be variance and covariance and contravariance and all kinds of things with all these combinations of features. And we're going to let the computer figure out the best way to deal with these. Yeah. Oh, hey, look, we got results. Cool. Isn't that colorful? Um, let's see. This is M's Morales from Andorra, 1998. Ah, yes, Andorra. Who doesn't remember Andorra? Um, constraint maps. Yeah, no, that's cool. So, um, possible constraints imposed by white pieces with the red representing pawn constraints, yellow minor piece, green rook, blue green, queen, and blue being king restraints. Um, to the right diagram identifies possible constraints imposed by the black pieces. The white and gray squares represent the standard chessboard squares without constraints. Yeah, this is a yeah. That's night transfer looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Um, so from B seven, it can go to A five to C four to B two. It's not limited to B two though. It could also like take the bishop or go over here and stuff. But yeah, these are paths the knight can go to two and three squares. Uh, what's this diagram? An influence diagram. Interestingly, this reminds me of, like, Chess Master, f like, 5,000 or 5,500 and stuff, when it would just color the squares based on what a player is currently attacking. Um, so, let's see, how am I to read this? Oh, is this the influence diagram of the knight? Yeah. So the red squares are places it can go to in one move happens that there happens to be a pawn here on d6, but still the knight could go through d8 to get to g7, although g7 itself is also occupied. Um, but yeah, the knight's got a lot of options. Turns out a knight on pretty much any square will have a feature map that looks more or less like this. You can put the knight on any square on the board and you'll find that like half the board is lit up. It's beautiful. Um, you should actually try that sometime if you haven't done it already. Well, I say you should, but like the point is that a knight can pretty much get anywhere on the chessboard. It's a very difficult to predict piece. The only time it's restrained is if it's on the rim, or if it's somehow super terribly placed on the second rank or something behind the bonds. Knights are pretty mobile pieces. Um, that said, they make really cool-looking diagrams if you color them this way. So, um, here we have a, a diagram for the bishop c1. Well, yes, the bishop on c1 could go to all these squares, but aren't there pawns in the way? 
So this is what we're talking about, an influence diagram where the bishop has all this potential, but it's not tapped yet because the pawns are in the way. Um, yeah, that's almost true. That, like, in four moves, a knight can pretty much go anywhere. Knights cover ground very quickly. Now that, the caveat to that, is that if you've got some kind of mating attack, um, and the knight doesn't have three moves to get where it needs to go, then the knight's not the fastest piece. Or if you've got an end game, where a king and some pawns, or some connected pawns, are racing, again, there, the knight's not the fastest piece. But if you've got some position where there's pawns, oh, I'm sorry, some closed or semi-closed or semi-open position, um, the knight can get to quite a few spaces um, in a pretty reasonable time frame. And it tends to spook other pieces into moving away, like rooks and queens and bishops tend to move away when attacked by a knight. Sometimes the bishops don't, though. Uh, figures 11 and 12 examine a position from the recent Umiansky World Correspondence Game. Um, so, controlling... I'm not actually familiar with this correspondence game here. Umiansky versus the World, in 2009. But, um, apparently... Um, constraint map goes da, 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 queen on e8, where the queen could end up. Um, trying to figure out which piece it's trying to illuminate here. Oh, I'm sorry, no, these are the constraints in this position. So you could see, like, white's pawns cover all those things in red in the top, um, in the center diagram. In the top right diagram, we see in red what black's pawns cover. So we get to see that uh, Umansky const is controlling a lot of squares but also has tremendous pot potential for all his remaining pieces whereas uh, the world doesn't have so much potential with the knight hanging out on b4, the rook hanging out on a8. Uh, Umansky's position is somewhat better. Um, but okay. Conclusions. Okay. Wow. That was quick. Um, yeah, so this algorithm detects trap pieces because that's what it's designed to do. Um, the computer can use the heuristic knowledge present in the influence diagram and simulation diagram to estimate the strategic position of how fully engaged each piece is in the game. The maps are a useful holistic measurement of capacity to produce stress in the position and can be used as part of an oriented vital system level indicator to predict and manage the sustainable development of a position in a chess game. I think, yeah, no, this sentence has quite a bit of merit that um, students can learn a lot from using such a application. Um, now, granted, it might not have a very good interface, I don't know, but identifying these features and having students be able to identify the features seems like a valuable part of analysis, as much so as knowing what's the stockfish number for a given position. It seems like being able to identify features is at least, if not more important, um, than just knowing is this a good or a bad position knowing why seems at least as important. All right, so ecosystems are working models of sustainable, complex systems, and it's reasonable to study them for the, study them for clues to the sustainable management of the human enterprise. We identify systems thinking in the systems approach as the theoretical basis for an evaluation function, shifting our uh, focus from the parts to the whole. The use of approximate language in the conceptualization of a network of interacting components is realized through a system dynamics model of stress or positional pressure. You know, I want to take like these three sentences 
this here. It, it feels like you could make a Mad Lib that would be capable of just like throwing any words in the middle of these sentences. Perhaps there is a Mad Lib generator of sorts that could produce a paper of a very similar variety that uses lots of buzzwords. Um, I'm not saying he's using it wrong. It's just, I guess I just don't appreciate what it means to be a systems person. Um, so let me skip to the next part of the paper, which I find interesting. Um, do, 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 do. I'm skimming through this so you don't have to. might borrow the words of economist Joseph Schumpeter and theorize that chess is a game of creative destruction. Future work <coughs> Future work will involve the development of an effective search strategy in order to maximize the usefulness of the proposed heuristic in a computer chess program. We will also investigate positions where the proposed heuristic does not work in providing insight and direction in search efforts. Okay. Um, I don't know. There's something systems related in this. Uh, special thanks to my friends at chessgames.com, uh, through whom I continue to learn about chess. Yeah, no, he has some interesting ideas. I think if he collaborated with other people, that could take him down a notch. Um, just to a little more modest domain. Um, so he's got related questions. Um, uh, related questions. Oh, these aren't even... Okay, so he's not, like, having a future work section. These are still kind of cool quotes. Um, so, is there anything else to this? Additional quotes. MySite.Verizon.net Yeah, I'm not going there. Um, yeah, future work will involve the development of an effective search strategy to maximize the usefulness of a proposed heuristic. He's not wrong. The problem is DeepMind did that. So, um, yeah, they kind of beat him to the punch on that one. Can't imagine why. Uh, yeah. He's very ambitious. Appendix of quotations. <laughs> You know, I think he could have done better. I think he could have, like, written a whole book full of quotations. That's pretty great. Um, is there more to this? He does cite his sources, so kudos to him for that. He does recognize that there is future work, that he hasn't solved it yet. Um, I honestly hoped that he was going to pivot more, like, so, what was this last section? This last section's five pages about conclusions. Perhaps a little bit longer than I would have expected. Um, sustainable development. Da -da -da, responsibility of the best model available, despite its limitations. Uh, modeling is a process of communication and persuasion among modelers, clients, and other stakeholders. You have a soft systems methodology. He does manage to avoid the word synergy. I'm impressed. So, um, yeah, no, uh, I just, our evaluation, I, I just don't get it. Like, he came up with a methodology and a way of being able to evaluate a chess position, and then I don't see any numbers. Like, some sort of test results would kind of test the viability of the model, although he mentions that he still needs a search strategy to accompany the model. 
But, yeah, it seems like even if it didn't perform well, there would still be a way to be able to test the model other than just painting this art. But, um, yeah, no, I still think this sort of thing is more advanced than what most chess players get out of an engine these days. Most players are like, yeah, this is the principal variation, so therefore I understand the position and I know I'm better. Which isn't really how chess works. Chess has in both a tactical aspect and a positional aspect to it. Um, so, yeah, we found this paper. Um, a proposed heuristic for a computer chess program. Um, which then he later calls an evaluation and then talks about the evaluation as actually being a uh, search technique and then um, promptly backs away and talks about how there isn't a way to search. Um, it seems like he could have used a, somebody to help him um, analyze what he wrote there. But he does have some original ideas so, um, kudos to him for publishing this. Yeah, I should take a look at the link there uh, for the intermediate features of a neural network engine. So, let's see. This is uh, light vector go nn. All right. So we're gonna go to light vector go and in unless I typoed it yeah sandbox for playing with neural networks for go um, this repo is a sandbox for personal experimentation and neural network training in go I've only put a little work into making this usable by others since this is foremost a personal sandbox but if you're interested here's how to get started training a model experimental notes history no major architectural changes, but added player ranks as the input feature to the neural net. And uh, indicated, included a lot of amateur games in the training set. Filtered pro games with the resulting net to find instructive positions for players of different ranks. Oh, cool. We're going to bookmark this and follow its development. I know he says he's not like, trying to make this actively something that... Um, other people can use, but I'm determined. We're going to use it somehow. <laughs> um, not to say that I'm immediately going to embark on doing that, but certainly I am an aspiring Go student. I could learn a thing or two. Um, even if this isn't the best teacher, it's probably an okay teacher. And if it's not, we'll know within, I don't know, some period of testing with it, we'll know that um, the system has failed. Right. Um, but yeah, no, that's really cool. And he's done some development on it this year. Um, ladder blocks and larger neural nets. And in a row, the curve results represent the large improvement from embedding global pooled properties. Uh, current results, the best neural nets we've been training from the sandbox have been quite good at matching or exceeding results you've uh, seen published elsewhere, presumably due to the combination of the various enhancements discussed below. Oh, that's cool. Um, I think in a puzzle sort of sense, if it was able to produce puzzles and I could try training on the puzzles, I could learn something. I wouldn't in general be playing against um, a bot, if only because I think I'm having, I'm actually learning things by playing against human players. Um, although I have been doing Sumego quite a bit recently too. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that all the results are precisely comparable. In above papers, different authors made different choices about the date range, etc. Um, overall, I think most of these choices shouldn't affect results too much, but I would guess that. Uh, I would guess could have, but, uh, bleh, but I would guess could affect accuracy numbers by a reasonable fraction of a percent. 
Um, okay. Uh, choice of loss function. Um, just use cross entropy or L2 loss uh, when training the neural net. I've performed detailed experiments, but in two of the training runs, my own neural nets to produce results for the above table, found that using L2 loss increased the test set top one accuracy while decreasing top four accuracy and the average log likelihood by about 0.05 nats. Okay, I, I forget what nats refers to. Directionally, this is in line with what I expect from theoretical priors. L2 loss cares relatively more about the total probability of a uh, mass of correct classifications, uh, while cross entropy cares about avoiding putting too small probability and surprising moves. So it's not surprise. So it's unsurprising that L2 does slightly better than top one, while cross entropy does better in the tail. Now that makes sense. Nats is like bits, but base e. Oh, okay. Ah, it's a measure of information like bits. So it's a uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So decreasing the log top four accuracy and the average log likelihood by about point oh oh five nats. Okay. It's like bits, but in base E, it's a measure of information. Um, so the cross entropy, oh, the loss of cross entropy, which is the average log likelihood, which, okay, yeah, now I see. Uh, uh, right, 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 right. That's why he's using the word nats there. Yeah. If it was log base 2, it would be bits instead of nats. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. Uh, architecture, the neural nets, um, consists of 5x5 five five convolution. Oh, that's cool. I would have expected a much more sophisticated convolutional model, but that's... Uh, again, there's a lot of ways you could tune all your parameters and hyperparameters and such, but um, so that's what he's been doing here. Unfortunately, many papers don't report the cross entropy loss, which is the same because its values are very nicely interpretable. Yeah, fair enough. Also, to get an idea of top one tier accuracy. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. There's a lot of information here. It's a bit much for me. Next idea is, as of March 2018, I'm happy with the above results and plan to move on to experiments of other kinds, such as using neural nets to investigate systematic differences between players of different ranks. Or maybe investigating if there's a reasonable self-play process for generating training games for a value net for territory scoring rather than area scoring. Um usable self-play process for generating turn games for a value net for territory scoring rather than area scoring. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, I see. So he wants to see if there's a way to perform territory scoring. Um, given that Y is a small but systematic advantage at 7.5 coming program difference from the era of 5.5 shows that black has a clear edge there curious what alpha zero strength bots would favor at six and a half comey if only they had the finer granularity of territory scoring where six and a half comey would actually meaningfully different than 7.5 of course i might revisit these results if i get more ideas for enhancements to try that seems ambitious regardless like solving go for a number seems hard Solving 9x9 nine nine go seems easier. Why wouldn't you start there? Um, but okay. Um, special 
ladder residual blocks. You know, ladders are hard. Uh, ladder detection is good. Um, I'm too much of a go beginner to catch on with most ladders, but I'm improving at that. Using ladders as an extra training target. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So, global pooled property. I'm looking at the scroll bar here. The scroll bar is like to the right of this. You see the top of the monitor, the bottom of the monitor down here. The scroll bar is like, there's a lot more to scroll through here. I'm going to struggle with this. I'd rather get my hands on it and experiment with it. Um, but also I understand it's going to be hard to set up. Um, although I could work on trying to make this easier for people to set up. Um, particular, oh, in fact, um, yeah, while I could work on making it easier to set up, I know who is familiar with Docker or very interested in learning Docker. I think he might also be interested in helping me get this become easier, but I don't think it's going to be too hard. I think it's something I could manage to set up and learn a thing or two from. I'm curious about the technology choice now. What would it take to get this set up? He did list the prerequisites. Um, and I kind of skipped over it because I was more curious about what it was, but now I'm curious about how to install it, so we go back up and look at the prerequisites. Um, so you got to have Python 3 and TensorFlow and a pre-trained model or train it yourself. You use a GTP engine. Um, oh, you could do things with the model, like run a GTP engine using the model to directly move, to dump one of the raw weight matrices, or to run a model on a position from a save game frame file, file, an SGF file. So, okay, that's cool. See, license for software license. License aside, informally, if you do successfully use any of the code or wacky ideas about neural net structure explored in this repo, um, I would love to hear about it and also appreciate a casual acknowledgement where appropriate. Yay! All right, see license for license details. License. The code in this repository currently relies on uh, two other libraries. Except for those libraries, this is as follows. Okay, let's let's look at this. There we go. <sighs> is this like the BSD or MIT or something? I should have looked. Um, well, no, the GitHub doesn't label these things as such. Permission is hereby granted free of charge to any person obtaining a uh, copy of the software and associated documentation files the software to deal it the software without restriction, including without limitations to rights to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, with sublicense, or sell copies of the software, and to permit persons to whom the software is furnished to do so subject to the following conditions. The above copyright notice and this permission notice shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software. It's provided as is without warranty. If it lights your computer on fire, it's not my fault. Okay, got it. License aside, informally, oh, that's what he's saying. Yeah. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, I think that seems like this is free to use. There's no problem there. Um, and I don't intend to do much more than using it, but, um, yeah, if I intend to, like, make my own version and had to give credit, I could certainly give credit. That's not an issue either. Unless somehow it legally entangles me and whatever, and now I'm responsible for somebody's computer catching on fire, and... I'm not able to give my own disclaimer about please don't sue me or the original copyright holder, but I don't think it's that sort. So yeah, um, these are the prerequisites, Python 3 TensorFlow, get a model, do things with the model, that's how you do it. Um, now he did mention he didn't make this necessarily the easiest for other people to use because he's only done a little um, work into making this usable by others. Um, 
in particular, I'm not seeing like an install.py or some sort of installer script, um, nor any sort of like, these are all the dependencies. I know he mentions you need these two things. I'd be surprised if it would just work out of the box with just those two things. And that's probably what he's talking about, that um, it's not necessarily easy for everybody to pick up. So I'm going to put this on hold for a little while. I will take a look at it. We'll get it installed. But uh, I've been doing a ton of coding this week for other stuff anyway, so not feeling it quite right now. Um, wait, why do I have this thing? Do I care about this thing anymore? It's 2D, 3D, chessboard, go board, reverse board software. This thing looked cool at one point. Um, eh, what the heck. I'll keep it starred and keep watching it, but I'm not really watching how it's developing. And there's VSimBot, which is just awesome. Um, somebody found some dependencies and they're vulnerable in ways of cleaning those up, so yeah, that's cool for VSimBot. Um, oh, it probably will work out of the box. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I guess we could try it out. And here I say, like, I wasn't going to do much coding and whatever, but I don't think it'll be too hard. If I... If you find me adrift at sea, I'm not able to like find my way back or something. Um, tell them it was a good journey. Uh, I don't know. Oh, hey, look, we got eight security updates. Um, maybe I should like apply my security updates once in a while. What do you think? Uh, do I have TensorFlow? At one point I did. I think at some point I un uninstalled it afterward. But I might have it. Um, still on one of my accounts. I don't think I have it installed as a global Python resource, but I think I have it installed on one of my usernames on this machine. Oh, I should just use, like, um, what's the search command in Linux? Locate. I should just locate TensorFlow and see if it's still out there. Uh, or if I'd have to install it again. At some point, I got flustered. Well, not with this machine. No, with the machine I'm actually trying to stream from. I was trying to do GPU-based TensorFlow. And it just all the dependencies didn't quite work right. So I wasn't able to do GPU-based TensorFlow. So I switched back to doing this all on Linux. Um, um, my home server here. Uh, TensorFlow. Um, grip. Is there anything that's not... Oh. Yeah, no, that's TensorFlow, right? Um, yeah, there's a lot of TensorFlows on this machine, but I think I have it. Python 3.6 site packages. I think that'll work. So, if I say git clone this thing, the Go Neural Network. Alright, we got it. Um, oh, it said Python and TensorFlow and stuff were required. Um, And what else do I need? One of these pre-trained models. Here's a model. Here's some problems. Alright. Here we go. Here's the model 232. Very cool. Yeah, I tried and I just failed, and that's okay. Okay, let's download the other downloadable, which is a bunch of Go problems, because why wouldn't you want the Go problems? 
I'm not sure whether these zip files themselves contain directories or not. Um, so what do we got? Unzip uh, neural network problems raw. Cool. Whoa, really, these are creative names. Um, didn't expect these names. Um, I mean, yeah, I know pickles are definitely a thing, but um, I just expected the more creative um, name, I guess. All right, so we got other stuff. Oh, okay. Make dir test one fifty two mile two thirty two. Um, we're gonna move everything into that new directory, and then we're gonna move that new directory neural network problems back up here. Oops. Um, here we go. So those are two things we unzipped. Um, so, I downloaded them. It probably expects me to do something meaningful after having done the download. <laughs> uh, okay, so, da, 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 it's a web server, something, something. Okay, so it works, great, perfect, it's working, maybe, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, these are the ways in which you can test it. Oh, create a models directory. All right, um, so uh, we're gonna make, make der, I'm sorry, we're gonna move temp whatever the model thing was called. I'm just going to call that models. Um, and then if I wanted to put more things into that directory, that wouldn't be such a big deal. Um, if you want a graphical Go instance, you can use Sabaki. Yeah, well, you're right. Um, I just want to run any one of these things. I don't really have any strong aspirations for what to do with it right now. Uh, so, I just want to make sure I've got it installed. Because uh, right now I think it'd be more interesting to play against people than against a bot. But it's still cool to have it installed. Um, okay, play dash model models directory model epoch, all right, whoops, oh, my terminal based copy and paste is not working anymore, uh, play model models directory model something dot epoch, um, I'm guessing that's the thing. Uh, close enough. It works! Maybe. Probably I didn't specify the right file. Um, config.json? Nope. Um, model 232. Oh, hey! Hey, look! It runs! It runs! Victory! That's what I meant by epoch. Apparently. Apparently I correctly specified model 232. So... Um, that could be used to play, uh, to make moves directly by running a GTP engine. 
Uh, you can dump one of the raw weight matrices. You can run a model on a position from an SGF file. All right. So I think this is running a GTP engine. Unfortunately, I don't know the GTP protocol. And also, this is running on a Linux box, and I don't have graphical access to the front end at the moment. So uh, my best bet is to learn GTP or to get all the front end stuff set up. But hey, it runs. Um, help. <laughs> Question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's cool. If you dump the weights, you can map them to a board to get a picture of what the net is thinking. Yeah, this is true. It's, again, probably easier that I just use something like Sabaki, as you were mentioning, instead of um, trying to like yeah I could dump the weights that that would actually accurately represent what it's looking at Spocky probably would not provide that sort of information um, I still think like having this as a puzzle like a sume go helper or generator or something like that as more of a training tool than an opponent is probably more interesting to me um, so I'm sure there, it's capable of quite a few things. I'm just not sure the best way to use it. Um, either way, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to need this particular command anymore. Uh, yeah. There we go. Um... And we can update the stream title while we're at it. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah. I'm not sure what more to do with this until I manage to get a front end attached to it. There was a point at which um, somebody developed a very primitive uh, web-based um, Go neural network opponent and a lot of people downloaded it and I was one of those many people and I managed to get it up and running on my server and then soon after I guess um, there was the uh, what was it the deep mind challenge um, with AlphaGo versus Lee Siddle and um, after that I don't know, I took more of an appreciation of Sumego and realized that there's a lot more for me to learn before I could play effectively against an AI opponent. Um, I am curious what's in the commit history of this project. Okay, it's not necessarily the easiest commit history to read and understand in a concise way. Um, but yeah, you can at least look at the change notes that are in uh, his readme file here. Um, so that's good. Um, you're right, though. I was able to just drop it in and run it, and it was running just fine because I had TensorFlow already installed. Um, don't necessarily know the GDP protocol, but I mean, I could look it up. GTP Go Protocol. Uh, what would be an example? What would be an example? Uh, I just want a single Go command that I can run to verify that I get a response. Um, it's not that simple, is it? Here's a working document in HTML. Purpose of the protocol history communication model. It's asymmetric and involves two points, which are the control and the engine. The controller is typically some kind of arbiter, and the engine is typically a Go playing program. All communication is uh, initiated by the controller, 
um, to which the engine responds. So, regression testing, or controller to engine, it sets up a board position, and then asks the engine to generate a move. Yep, yep, yep. So, reference implementation go basics. Here's the control characters, the white space, the command structure, error messages, and so forth. Private extensions, protocol details, panic situations. Um, the correct action is just to close the connection. Okay, that's cool. Uh, syntactic entities. Commands. A command has one of the syntaxes. ID, command name arguments. ID, command name, command name arguments, and command name. Great. Um, there's success responses and important concepts and handicap placement and such. That's cool. Alright. Time handling, scoring, internal state. Required commands. Protocol version. Yes. Let's try this. This looks like a command. Protocol version 2. Yeah, check it out. We got a valid command. Alright. Uh, come on. Alright, so we'll look at this. GNU Go. Oh. Alright, so you're telling me I should download... No, I'm sorry. Here's the Go text protocol from GNU.org. GNU's not Unix. Uh, all right. You're right. All right, so here we go. Board size seven. Oh, wait, can I make something that's like board size one? We gotta do this now, don't we? Do, 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 do. Um, board size one. Invalid board size. Damn, it's good. <laughs> uh, okay. I suppose it does that with all the board sizes other than the one it was trained on. Board size nine. Oh, it actually took it. Board size 2. It takes. Okay, well, that's not what we were striving to do anyway. I was just curious if I could break it. And evidently I succeeded at breaking it. Um, no, we didn't need this. We need the this one. Clear board, play this, etc. Um, gen move white. Play black, play black. Show board. Oh, so you can actually show board to take a look at the board. Probably need to issue a clear board first. Oh, nah, I guess it doesn't implement that one yet. Um. <laughs> uh, it's only trade on 19 by 19. Yeah, you're right that the protocol supports um, this. I'm just being silly. Um, yeah, let's try board size 19, or 129 if I typo. Clear board, um, here, gen move black. I want to see you come up with a move. D16. Alright. Play white. C16. Gen move black. C17. Ooh, it's good. Okay. Play white. Uh, let's see. B17, right? Gotta keep the pattern going. Keep the engine on its heels. Gen move black. D17. I have a sense I might not be winning this. Alright. <laughs> well, we'll show it. We will show it. You thought you were playing on D17. Play Black D17. Yes!
We win. All right. Didn't see that. <laughs> I guess that's the go equivalent of um, tipping over the chessboard. So yeah, I win. That's. But um, yeah, no, it works. So uh, well, very well done. Um, it's not quite resilient to this kind of attack, but not that it should be. <laughs> it makes sense that it like gives up when that happens. I probably would give up too in its defense. But yeah. Um, so that's light vector going in. A sandbox for playing with neural networks with Go. Uh, light vector also apparently works on what? Leela analysis and Arima server and apparently he's doing a lot of really cool things. A Hanabi bot? Wait. Hanabi, isn't that Isn't that what I think it is? The The board game of Hanabi or the card game Hanabi? Um Or am I thinking of some other game? This is something I thought would be really cool if I made, um, yeah, I thought this would be awesome if I made, like, an AI for this, but apparently this guy's already done it. Um, the point of this game is you're able to see cards in other players' hands, but not your own hand, and you're cooperating to try to defuse all these, or to set off fireworks in the correct pattern without having any fireworks explode on you. Apparently he made a Hanabi bot. I'll be. How'd he do it? Also, what's the license? MIT license. That's cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so this light vector dude apparently knows what's up. No, he last developed this three years ago or whatever, but still. This is awesome. This is written in what language? There's lib and test. I thought it said OCaml. I don't know the language. I've never dealt with this language before. Um, so that's pretty clever, though. Um, got a rudimentary eval working, likely buggy. Still, impressive that he endeavored to try it. Um, it's a difficult game, that's for sure. So I wouldn't expect there to be a um, working version of that just yet, but that's still very impressive that he endeavored to do it. Um, what else did he do? I don't know. Um, he's done some stuff with Crazy Stone. Oh, he attempted a Hanabi Bot rewrite in Scala. So that makes more sense. Um, Wow! It actually wins a game. The fact that it wins any games at all is amazing. Dang! We're starring that. But also, I'm gonna like follow him and see what he's up to. It's a light vector. Really cool guy, apparently. He operates pseudonymously, but that's okay. Um, yeah, it's what Dark Twinge plays. You're right. Yep, yep, yep. So, that's really cool. Um, let's see. Contributors, David Wu. Hey, David Wu. Um, isn't that his name? Because if I read the license, yes, that's Light Vector David Wu. Okay. Don't need the protocol things open anymore. Yeah, so you made Go and N, you made Fireflower, he's making all kinds of cool stuff. Um, very nice. Uh, we'll take one brief look, hopefully brief, at Leela Analysis. Um, only because he's really got my curiosity at this point about stuff he's doing. 
Uh, I don't want to get sucked into this forever, but... Um, go through every position in the provided game. Find out what it considers to be all the mistakes by both players. Producing an SGF file. Oh, this is Go. And this is not like Leela Zero with chess. Although it could perhaps be adapted to chess, I don't know. Um, but the idea of having something that generates um, output based on a save game file being analyzed is a pretty generic concept. Um, there's no reason I should try to readapt this for chess, because such a thing already exists for chess that can run any engine, so you could just plug Leela into that. But uh, this analyzes a Go game and annotates mistakes in the Go game. Which... Hmm. I don't know. It's exciting and terrifying at the same time. So I don't want to touch it. But it's cool that he did it, I guess. I'm just not going to pursue that any further. Um, but yeah. Fireflower seems really cool. Uh, it seems like if you were to throw in some machine learning, you could do even better. But that's... Honestly, I'm impressed that it wins any games at all, because this is a really tough game. Um, now, there are ways you could cludge it to hack communications between the players, like defining a protocol in the same way that throwing certain cards in bridge has meaning beyond the immediate context, you could have a way of saying that if a player does a given action and sees certain things, that it means a very specific thing, but if, assuming you're not trying to cheat like that, um, if, assuming you're trying to um, solve the game in a way that none of the players have ever met each other before and are just communicating using the information available in the game, um, it seems like that's something that's very hard to solve. Um, but they, anyway, uh, yeah, today we looked at a lot of cool stuff, we read that academic paper, um, we are looking at software developed by Light Vector, we did install GoNN, we actually managed to, like, uh, well, we did something here. There's no reason for me to characterize it, because it's just too funny, and it's best left characterized the way it is here. Um, so, let's wrap things up with one word of wisdom. Our word of wisdom for the day is, you have a strong appeal for members of the opposite sex. Okay, well, uh, that's our word of wisdom. Now let's try again. Here we go. This is better. An avocado tone refrigerator would look good on your resume. There we go. That's our word of wisdom for the day. Um, so, yeah, Fortune and Kause are a godsend. Really, it's a pity that, like, not every login on every machine, or that logins on every machine don't do this. This should be, like, a standard feature on every operating system. And also be cool if they brought back Microsoft Bob. Microsoft Bob was great. But anyway, um, yeah, an avocado tone refrigerator would look great on your resume. It doesn't have to make sense, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty great. So yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks again to Zwish for all the amazing contributions in today's stream. Um, it's, yeah, I think we've ended on a much more positive note thanks to that. So uh, it's been fun. Uh, is this a Markov chain quote generator? Actually, no. Um, though you would think it would be. This is just a database of quotes. Um, I forget who maintains this stuff these days, but there's a file on the file system that just has this database. Or maybe it is actually just a database these days. I don't know. Don't know what the database driver would be. Um,
but yeah, uh, it's just a standard Linux utility that's backed by a database. Um, and cows say there's a variety of different cows you could use to print out the message. Yeah, uh, it's all very cool stuff. So, yeah, thanks for stopping by. It's been fun. Um, and maybe next time we'll do games. I keep saying that, but one of these streams, we are going to actually play a game. So, we'll see. Yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll uh, see you next time.